Oh, hello. Welcome to my video lecture on the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, for those of you who attended my lecture, uh, this is basically going to be a short summary, but we're going to cover the same uh, issues. So looking at uh, the different articles, uh, also looking at different types of rights. So you might remember absolute rights are the strictest, then limited, and then finally qualified rights as well. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to look at the history of the convention. So let's get into that straight away. So the background to the convention comes from two key sources, in particular World War II, where the human rights abuses com uh, committed during that, in particular thinking about the Holocaust, but also the British abuses such as the bombing on Dresden uh, and the Soviet states' uh, human rights abuses against their own people. The idea being that in order for this not to happen again, we need to have a convention to pr prevent these human rights abuses. Um, the other idea behind the convention is more politically motivated, so the map on the right shows the USSR after World War II, so you can see it's taken over much of Eastern Europe. Uh, and the idea was that there needed to be a union on the west of Europe to effectively counteract Soviet influence. And a good way of doing this was to have a group of nations who were committed to uh, human rights. Two key figures involved in the establishment of the convention. On the left, we have Sir David Maxwell Fife, who was a prosecutor against Nazi war criminals, so he knew about the atrocities first hand committed. Uh, and on the right, we have Pierre Henri Taitgen, uh, who was a French resistance fighter, uh, and so he knew a lot about sort of Nazi governance. Uh, with this in mind, um, the convention was based on the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, um, which was an American concoction um, created after World War II, and so it sli slightly followed that. Uh, in some areas it's a bit more expansive, in some areas it's, it's less expansive, um, but it's basically the European version of that. So it was signed in November 1950, and it actually came into force in September 1953. Uh, now, in order for the convention to actually be effective, uh, there needed to be a judicial arm. So here we have the European Court of Human Rights, which is a horrendously ugly building, um, but it effectively decides on cases involving human rights abuses. So we can have applications by individuals, so you as a citizen of a member state could bring a case against the country. States also sometimes bring cases against other states. Now this doesn't happen very often um, because of the potential diplomatic fallout that would occur, um, but it's still possible that it could happen, so uh, we'll see later that there are examples of that. Advisory opinions are also things that the court can issue. Um, the idea behind this is if there's a particular right or an issue that comes up um, and the court wants to give an indication on where it stands on a particular issue, then it can do that by issuing an advisory opinion. Uh, now, the man on the right there is Paul Mahoney. Uh, he's the UK judge to the European Court of Human Rights. So each member state gets its own judge. Uh, we're talking here about the uh, Council of Europe. Um, and this uh, is made up of about 47 member states, including places like Russia and the Ukraine. So it's much bigger than the EU, for example, includes a lot more states within it. These judges serve a non-renewable nine-year term. They have to be of high moral character and normally also have to have previous judicial experience within their own country. <clears throat> Uh, so there's a number of different ways that the court can actually sit. Uh, committees are very small, made up of only three judges, and they basically decide on the admissibility of cases. So what they're asking here is, does the case actually concern human rights abuses? Uh, and if it does, uh, can it actually move forward? Uh, if it does move forward, it goes to a chamber, which is made up of seven judges, and they actually decide on the case. So has there been a, an abuse of human rights in this situation? Um, particularly important cases can be moved to a grand chamber, so this is kind of like an appeal process within the court, um, and particularly sensitive or controversial issues or even issues that come up quite regularly, um, this is a good way because the 17 judges involved of getting an authoritative decision on a particular matter. <clears throat> Now, in the UK, there was no right to individual petition until 1966, so the convention came into force in 1953, but you as an individual couldn't actually bring a case until 1966. Now, even after 1966, it was actually quite hard to do this because you had to exhaust all domestic remedies first. In other words, if you brought a case in the High Court, it would then have to be appealed to the Court of Appeal and then the House of Lords, as it was then, before you could actually go to the European Court on Human Rights. 
Um, the problem with this is obviously that it would take a lot of time. So we're looking at, at, you know, four or five years for a case to actually get that far. And it would also be hugely expensive for people as well. So paying lawyers fees right from the start, right through to the end as well. Um, so this was the advantage of the Human Rights Act that came in in 1998. The Labour government sought to bring rights home, was the phrase that they used, and it basically gives effect to the convention within UK law. Uh, in other words, if you did bring a case now before the High Court, the High Court itself would be able to apply the convention um, straight away without having to go through all of the other courts as well. So the Human Rights Act uh, was passed in 1998 and then I put there that it came into force from October 2000. Uh, so there's a number of different rights, like I mentioned at the start, we've got absolute rights, limited rights and qualified rights. So we'll start with absolute rights. Uh, and this is basically a right that the state can never impinge or take away. Um, so we've got a couple of examples there. Article 3 is the prohibition of um, torture. So in other words, you can never be tortured. It can never be impinged. The state can never torture you. It's an absolute right. Similarly, Article 4 is the prohibition of slavery. You can never volunteer to be a slave if you'd want to do that. Um, and similarly, uh, no one can force you to be a slave. The state could never force you to work for free, for example. Limited rights are a little bit different and um, they're almost absolute rights, but there's some key exceptions to them. So the best example would be Article 5, which is your right to liberty. Um, so you do have freedom of movement to sort of go around the country and you shouldn't be impinged by the state in any way. Um, but the exception would be, as the picture suggests on the right, um, that if you're arrested lawfully, then that is a, a legitimate breach of your right to liberty. Similarly, prisoners as well who are serving a custodial sentence, uh, they can have their right to liberty um, limited in that regard. Article 6 is the right to a fair trial, which again, you might think is an absolute right, um, but where there's particular issues of national security, it might be necessary to hold a trial in secret, for example. So that's the sort of limitation we're talking about there. Uh, qualified rights are uh, rights that are balanced against the interests of society and the rights of others. So in other words, you do have the right on the one hand, but it has to be balanced against it. So these are the most interesting rights because we're comparing individual rights against societal rights on the other hand. So there's a number of examples that we'll look at in more detail. Article 8 is right to privacy, Article 9 freedom of thought, Article 10 freedom of expression, and Article 11 is uh, right to freedom of assembly. So let's have a look at seeing how these actually work in practice. So I've got Article 11 up here uh, and Paragraph 1 effectively sets out the right as clearly as possible. So you do have the right to freedom of assembly. Now, a bit of a long quote here, but Paragraph 2 basically sets up the restrictions. Um, so there has to be a law in place that um, is prescribed and there are also a number of different um, constraints on your right to freedom of assembly. So we've got things like here, the interests of national security, for example. Um, so how does this actually work in practice? Well, we can say that you do have the right to freedom of assembly because that's guaranteed within Article 11.1. But this right can be restricted. So this is where we look at paragraph two. This is often the formulation for qualified rights. So paragraph one sets out the right. Paragraph two sets out the limitations. So there's two conditions that apply. There has to be a law that allows the restrictions. So for example, the Public Order Act of 1986. Um, and also one of the following conditions has to apply as well. So we've already talked about the interests of national security, but there's a number of others there as well. Uh, so interestingly, we've got protection of the rights and freedoms of others. In other words, you could protest, but obviously it would be unfair to let you protest in someone's front garden uh, because that would impinge on their right to privacy or right to private property as well. So uh, now that we've sort of got an idea about the different types of rights, let's have a look through some of the convention articles. I'm going to go through from about Article 2 right through to Article 14 um, and then look at some of the other protocols as well. So Article 2 is your right to life. Um, it's the right to refrain from the unlawful deprivation of life, but it actually goes a lot further than that. So I've put about the duty to investigate there. That includes things like the coroner's court that you might have heard of in the UK. Uh, and there's also a positive obligation to avoid the loss of life as well. So to give you an example, the case of Osman uh, versus the UK uh, was a case about a teacher who was obsessed with their student and kept stalking them. 
Uh, the parents and uh, kept going to the police and informing them about this teacher, but the police didn't do anything about it. And unfortunately, what happened in the end was the teacher went round to the student's house, shot both the student and the student's father. The student survived, but was badly wounded, uh, and the father unfortunately died. Um, the family brought a case based on Article 2 in the right to life, uh, and it was found that the police did have that obligation to avoid the loss of life there. Article 3 we've already talked about, prohibition of torture and how it's an absolute right. Um, Ireland and UK is the key case in this situation. Um, basically what happened here was a number of IRA soldiers were arrested by the British Army and were tortured by them. Um, and Ireland brought a case against the United Kingdom. So we talked earlier, this is one of the unusual situations where a state brought a claim against another state. Um, and the court took the opportunity in this situation to actually come up with a definition of torture. Um, so they came up with the definition there, and so we have this idea of a threshold test. So in other words, because Article 3 is an absolute right, once you reach that, reach that threshold or that definition of torture, it doesn't matter what excuses or ifs and buts the state puts forward, um, once you reach that threshold, uh, it is an abuse of your rights. <coughs> Prohibition of slavery and forced labour seems a bit archaic nowadays, but I've put a case there to show that it is still relevant. Human trafficking is still a major problem within Europe uh, and something that is important to address. And so a case was brought against Cyprus and Russia by Rantsev in 2010, um, considering issues of, sort of modern day slavery. And uh, this is often to do with uh, sex trafficking and things like that. Article 5 is the right to liberty and security. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about this in terms of it being a limited right. I've put there about Article 5.3 as well. Um, so you're entitled to a trial within a reasonable time or release pending trial. So Erdem versus Germany is a case that discusses that further. Um, and the idea behind this basically being that you can't uh, be arrested and then just left to rot in a cell without actually having a trial to prove that you are guilty. Uh, Article 6 kind of carries on with this theme, so we've got the right to a fair trial. Um, and Article 6.3c is an interesting one because it um, raises issues surrounding legal aid. Um, so a lot of people have argued recently that because of the government's legal aid cuts, um, it's actually an abuse of Article 6 and the right to a fair trial under, um, under the Convention. Article 7 is an interesting one. It really relates to sort of the rule of law. Um, so this Latin phrase, nulla poena sine lege, basically translates as there should be no punishment without law. Again, it goes a little bit further than this and argues for a right against retrospectivity as well. What we mean by this is that, say you went out wearing a red hat today and then the government created a law tomorrow uh, banning the wearing of red hats outside, um, then you couldn't be arrested for that because it was yesterday when you were wearing the red hat. Um, so, you know, you wouldn't know about the law at that time. <clears throat> uh, Article 8 is where things get a little bit interesting as well. So we talked a little bit about qualified rights. Um, this is sort of bringing up this idea again. So we've got the right to privacy on one hand, um, but this is balanced against the interests of society on the other. Again, during the years, the court has actually taken the opportunity to go a lot further and expand on these rights. Um, so Malone versus UK, which is from 1985, um, expands the right to respect for private life to a right to respect for correspondence as well. So things like emails, telephone calls, text messages um, would all, all be protected. Malone v UK um, considered uh, phone tapping, um, but it's quite an interesting case when you consider it in the light of sort of WikiLeaks um, and also sort of government retention of data, especially online. Article 9 is freedom of thought, conscience and religion. So we have another balancing act. So you do have the right to freedom of religion. Um, but for example, if that belief is offensive to other people, then there's a balancing act that has to take place there. So we have religion and obviously that would include a lot of things like Christianity, Judaism and uh, Islam. But we can also consider other things. So what about political views? What if you're a Labour supporter, for example? What if you're a pacifist? What about minor religions? So I've put Jedi there, which is a bit facetious, um, but you can imagine that sort of other religions would want to be taken seriously. And do they have the same right to um, protection? 
the reason I've put the picture on the left hand side of the different Muslim headdresses is because in France these are all banned um, and the question before the court was is it right that these should be banned and the court used something called margin of appreciation the idea behind the margin of appreciation is that different countries all have different cultural values so uh, what is culturally acceptable in the UK might not be culturally acceptable in somewhere like Russia or Italy or Spain basically all countries are different and the margin of appreciation is a way of respecting that now the uh, court used the idea of the margin of appreciation in this case to basically say France is a secular state and therefore it is fair that um, overt displays of religion such as the hijab or the niqab um, could actually be um, prohibited it was the idea that they put forward was that it was to do with the promotion of a cohesive society so these things should be banned in order to promote a cohesive society in France which is a non-religious country or secular country I should say Article 10 is freedom of expression, so it's a massively important within a democratic society. So um, it's really important that um, people's views are allowed to be expressed, um, the idea of political plurality, um, and it's um, a lot to do with sort of newspapers as well. So they should be allowed to sort of um, publish what they like, um, other things like books as well. Um, now, obviously, this is a qualified right, so controversial or offensive views may not be allowed. Pro-Life Alliance versus BBC um, was a case that came up during the 2001 election. The Pro-Life Alliance were a group that campaigned against abortions and they wanted as part of their political broadcast for the 2001 election to show images of uh, aborted fetuses uh, and other disturbing images. Um, now, obviously, the BBC sort of prevented that because um, they didn't want that uh, on at a sort of maybe seven o'clock in the evening when children might still be watching it. And it might sort of um, be offensive to some people that they were showing that. Uh, and so they brought a case and were successful against the Pro-Life Alliance saying that, OK, you do have freedom of expression, um, but that should be limited where your views are, where your expression is particularly um, offensive. Article 11, which is the freedom of assembly and association, um, is particularly relevant in the UK in conjunction with the Public Order Act 1986. So this uh, piece of legislation effectively allows the police to restrict protests in certain circumstances. So there's a few key sections for you to have a look at there. Section 11 refers to the advance notice of public processions. Um, section 12 looks at imposing conditions on public processions. Um, section 14 is the idea of imposing conditions on public assemblies. Um, and then section 16 is all about interpretation of that so what's the difference for example between a public assembly and a public procession um, Rahoni is an interesting case this was um, to do with a, a pro-Palestinian group that campaigned in Manchester city centre one Christmas um, and they were moved on by the police um, on the basis that it was during the Christmas period therefore it was dangerous to have any sort of big protest during that time um, the police imposed a number of different conditions such as having the protest moved to the outskirts of the town centre rather than the centre uh, and limiting the number of people as well. Um, Brahoni argued that uh, this would effectively ruin the point of the protest because not many people would see it um, but I think it was decided in the end that the conditions imposed were fair. Uh, so last few then, so right to marry, I've put a picture there of a lesbian wedding. Um, this is an interesting issue that comes up at the moment. So right to marry originally just meant the right to marry between a man and a woman. Uh, but we can see that this is expanding, particularly in the UK and Ireland recently as a result of referendums to include gay marriage. Now, the European Court of Human Rights has um, not allowed the right to gay marriage yet. Um, again, it comes back to this idea of margin of appreciation. So there's a case that involves Austria and the idea behind the decision was that, well, um, Austria is a Catholic country and so we need to have respect for the religious views that predominate in Austria and therefore it's um, right to restrict uh, marriage between same-sex couples. 13 is your right to an effective remedy. This can often mean damages as suggested in the picture um, but more often than not there might actually be an effective remedy um, that is nothing to do with damages. So for example article 5 your right to liberty if you've been wrongfully arrested 
um, you might not want damages you just want to sort of get out of that prison cell as soon as you can um, similarly with article 10 uh, your right to freedom of expression you might not want damages you might actually want the right to um, be able to express your views in a public manner so effective remedies can include compensation but more often than not they're tailored to a particular situation uh, prohibition of discrimination uh, comes up uh, in terms of race relations, as suggested by that amusing meme, um, but it can also cover an, a number of things as well, so country of origin, social background, uh, and a number of other things as well. So Article 14 is often brought alongside um, other article cases where groups feel that they've been discriminated against. Um, in times of emergency, states are allowed to derogate from certain rights. Um, so, for example, the right to a fair trial might be limited in times of emergency. Um, but remember that there are some absolute rights. So, for example, despite whatever sort of emergency is going on in the UK, for example, uh, there would never be allowed um, uh, any torture because that's an absolute right that torture is always prohibited. Uh, so finally, just before I finish, uh, there's a number of protocols to sort of look at as well. So right to fair and free elections is important in protocol one, peaceful enjoyment of property, um, right to education. So free and fair elections also includes the right to vote as well. The right to education uh, goes up to secondary level, but doesn't include the right to university education or higher education. Um, so that's why you would pay your £9,000 fees to me. Um, protocol 7 is the right to appeal in criminal cases, looking at different things between there. Equality between spouses is also important as well. Uh, family proceedings, so something to consider there. Uh, and finally, we've got the complete abolition of the death penalty, which comes from Protocol 13. So the convention is really interesting, a uh, lot of issues to discuss, very political in nature. Um, for a full understanding, remember to watch my video as well on the Human Rights Act. Um, but otherwise, remember to leave a like, uh, subscribe for more videos, uh, and also leave a comment below if you have any questions, and I will do my best to get back to you. Thanks for watching. Bye!